Boa tarde a todas, todas e todos que nos acompanham pelo Zoom e pelo YouTube. Hoje é o terceiro dia do Seminário Internacional de Arquivos Pessoais, que tem o objetivo de discutir o tema dos arquivos pessoais na contemporaneidade. Antes de começar, é importante registrar que as manifestações expressas pelos profissionais da Fundação Getúlio Vargas e pelos convidados que participam desse evento representam exclusivamente as suas opiniões e não necessariamente a posição institucional da FGV. Reiteramos também que todos aqui presentes concordaram em participar desse evento de forma espontânea e com isso autorizam o uso de sua imagem para essa transmissão que ficará disponível no canal da FGV no YouTube. Esse seminário é patrocinado pelo Conselho Internacional de Arquivos, o ICA, e está sendo transmitido pelo YouTube da FGV, sem tradução simultânea. Os inscritos no evento devem assisti-lo pela plataforma Zoom. Os links foram enviados a todos os participantes. O controle da presença para emissão de certificados é feito automaticamente pelo Zoom e para obter esse certificado é necessário participar de 75% de todo evento, incluindo os GTs. Caso alguém tenha tido algum problema ou tenha alguma dúvida, pode entrar em contato conosco pelo e-mail documentação.cpdoc.fgv.br. Vou dar mais algumas informações antes da gente começar nosso debate, nossa mesa. É, então, aproveito para informar que houve uma mudança no nosso, no nosso, na nossa programação. A mesa Arquivos Pessoais, Gestão e Tratamento Arquivístico do GT Arquivos Pessoais, Debates Contemporâneos, teve o seu horário alterado e vai começar às 4 horas da tarde, no dia 1 de abril. Para os participantes que estão assistindo o Zoom, o seminário está sendo, pelo Zoom, né? O seminário está sendo traduzido e você pode escolher o seu idioma, o idioma que quer assistir essa mesa, no botão interpretação. As perguntas, tanto para a Marika quanto para a Rachel, serão feitas pelo Q&A, que aparece também no, no, na parte baixa da tela de vocês do Zoom. É, aproveito para dar um último, um último informe, que a gente vai seguir conversando sobre o tema dessa mesa no GT, que vai acontecer na quinta-feira, no dia 1 de abril. É, a programação está no site do evento, então todos vocês estão convidados. Bom, e agora sim, entrando no, no tema desse, dessa nossa conversa, eu estou muito feliz de ter aqui a Marika e a Rachel. É, elas não sabem, mas de longe eu as sigo e acompanho os trabalhos, lendo os textos e, e, e conhecendo um pouco das suas atividades de rotina nas universidades em que atuam. Então, eu estou muito feliz de poder conversar com as duas. É, a Rachel, a gente recebe hoje a Rachel Winston, que é do Arquivo da Diáspora Negra, que trabalha no Arquivo da Diáspora Negra, da Universidade do Texas, e a Marika Seifer, da Universidade de Washington para discutir é, o impacto das teorias feministas e pós-coloniais na prática e pesquisa nos arquivos. Então, a gente vai começar pela Rachel, na sequência a Marika é, se apresenta e conversa um pouco conosco sobre suas pesquisas e debates que tem feito lá na Universidade de Washington. A Rachel Winston é arquivista da diáspora negra do LELAS, não sei se pronuncio certo, da Benson Latin American Studies and Collection, da Universidade do Texas, em Austin, e trabalha no Arquivo da Diáspora Negra, também conhecido como BDA, que foi idealizado em 2013 para coletar obras documentais, audiovisuais, digitais e artísticas relacionadas à diáspora negra das Américas e Caribe, com foco em pessoas e comunidades com uma conexão ancestral compartilhada com a África. Estou muito feliz de te receber aqui, Rachel. A palavra é sua. Tudo bem, muito obrigada a todos. Uh, a gente um, entendo português, mas não falo bem, então eu falo em inglês hoje. Um, But thank you, everyone, for the invitation to join you all today. I am very happy and honored to be here. I bring you greetings from what were the traditional homelands of the Tonkawa, Lipan Apache, Comanche, 
Isleta del Sur Puebla and other indigenous peoples who were dispossessed of their homelands. And before I begin, Dr. C4, Marika, it is really an honor to share space with you. So much of your work has influenced and been an important resource for me and my own thinking about archives as an archivist. The work you do in community archives, affect theory, feminist theory, and archival praxis is just tremendous. So thank you. I look forward to being in conversation with you today and with everyone who is gathered. I will share my screen now. Okay. So in this presentation, I will talk about the Black Diaspora Archive at the University of Texas, the project I manage. And with that, I will highlight a couple of collections I've worked with in this capacity. I'll then conclude by talking about some recent work and questions that I think about as an archivist who focuses on collections representing the Black diaspora of the Americas. In 2015, I joined the University of Texas as its inaugural Black diaspora archivist. With my hire came the formal launch of the Black diaspora archive commonly referred to as BDA, I will use the two. The BDA is a collaborative project that brings together partners from UT Libraries, Lilas Benson, Latin American Studies and Collection, the Department of Black Studies, and the Office of the President. The idea for the archive originated in Black Studies, who then approached Lilas Benson, the Latin American Studies Institute, and library who for a long time were collaborators um, with the idea of starting this archive. Having shared faculty and research interests and students, uh, it made sense to think about placing this archive in the Latin American Studies Library. It really was a natural home. And thinking more globally, having the Black Diaspora Archive live in the Latin American Studies Collection calls us to always be mindful of the Black presence across the global South. The Black Diaspora Archive has five primary collected areas. And here you see just a, a representation of what some of these things look like. So those collecting areas include art of the diaspora, including art scholarship, ethno-racial empowerment and advocacy, Black feminism of the Americas, slavery of the Americas, and the personal archives of scholars, thought leaders, activists, and fall into that as well, community folks. While the Black diaspora is global, as we know, Black folks are all over the world. This collection is focused on the Americas, using the Benson's collection, existing collection, strengths as its foundation. I will also mention here that the BDA is the repository for the Black Studies Department on campus. In addition to supporting manuscript and archival collections, as the Black Diaspora Archivist, I also work to expand the Benson's rare book holdings. This includes evaluating and reevaluating the collection. And I will say the Benson just celebrated its centennial. So that's a hundred years of collecting. There's a lot there to reevaluate, right? With a focus specifically on recovering Black and African influences and experiences across the Americas. I also acquire rare material published by and, a black, by and about Black communities across the Americas for special collections. Here, I have included a screenshot of the BDA blog, and you can see a partial list of the BDA collections, archival collections. I started this blog in the Black feminist spirit of community building, knowledge, and information sharing. The collections here you see that are hyperlinked have finding aids or inventories 
available online. Those that do not have the hyperlink are unprocessed, meaning there is no finding aid available now, but are included here so as to not further obscure these collections or prohibit access in the meantime. The blog also features posts that share news and updates related to the BDA. It has been a place to feature the experiences and intellectual contributions of interns, students, resident librarians, and community members. And at this point, I want to take a moment to talk about two collections in particular. The first is the Delta Xi, AKA Oral History Collection. And in this list, you can see it towards the middle of the screen. Several years ago, I approached the Department of Black Studies with an idea to create a paid undergraduate internship. Together, we worked to set up an endowment, a financial endowment in the Black Studies Department that was made possible by the philanthropy and incredible generosity of Black women, all alumni of the university and members of the Delta Xi chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Delta Xi is the first Black Greek letter organization established at UT Austin. The internship, known as the AKA Scholars Black Diaspora Archive Internship, was initially paused during the pandemic. But last year in 2021, I recruited an exceptional student and gave my best effort at coming up with a virtual internship experience. The focus of the virtual internship was to establish an oral history collection featuring members of Delta Xi, most of whom contributed to the internship's initial endowment. The women interviewed were students and active on campus during the 1960s and 1970s. The significance of this collection cannot be understated. It has created space to recognize the experiences, achievements, and ongoing contributions of Black women as told by them. This collection was developed in partnership with the library and the BDA leveraged its resources as a co-collaborator. The majority of this work was also completed by an undergraduate student, Brianna, and you can see her pictured here in the thumbnail photos. She wrote about her work in the collection in a series for the blog that I am excited to share have been shared widely by the university, those posts have. This collection was one of the first audiovisual and oral history collections to be made public in the library's new collections portal or digital asset management system. This is an open collection, meaning that in time, future interns will continue the work of building the archive. This gives them experience in oral history interviewing, metadata creation, archival processing, and particularly with born digital material. Next, I'd like to talk a little about a post-custodial archival collection. The Benson Latin American Collection at UT has been supporting post-custodial archival collections since 2014, so almost a decade. Within an archival framework, a post-custodial approach keeps collections in their place of origin and provides training, supplies, and funding to digitize the collection materials. Post-custodial collections rely on reciprocal relationships. Here, you see pictured our project team from UT and our partners, Equipe de Articulação e Assessorias às Comunidades Negras do Vale do Ribeira, or EECONE, in Sao Paulo in 2019. As an organization, EACONE was founded to identify, articulate, organize, and assist the Quilambola communities of the Hibera Valley, prioritizing their cultural preservation and attainment of territorial rights. Our team made two visits to EACONE, providing archival supplies, computers, scanners, and hard drives. We worked together to identify the kinds of materials from EACONE's archive that could be digitized during the project period. 
We also provided training to local technicians who were hired for the project on scanning and metadata processes. During the project period, technicians digitized collection materials in stages and sent them to us at UT Austin on the hard drives we provided. Once the project period is complete, our partners keep all of the equipment. One thing I want to mention here is the importance of representation. During one of our site visits, I had the opportunity to visit the Quilombo of Sao Pedro and spend time with the community. It was a very moving experience for me. Really, the whole project was. But this was significant because community members shared with me over and over again their surprise and excitement to see someone Black and a Black woman at that representing the library. They weren't expecting it. For me, this added another level of significance to the work I already take very seriously and am humbled to perform. It also speaks to the incredible need to hire and support and support people from diverse backgrounds within library organizations. Here you can see a screenshot of the platform our library uses to host post-custodial collections from seven collaborative partnerships. This site is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And here is just a snapshot of what the Eacone collection looks like so far. Now that I've talked a little bit about the BDA, the collections and the work that I do, I want to transition into sharing more about some recent published work and ideas I'm considering. Published just last year in 2021, Knowledge Justice is the first edited volume centering critical race theory in library and information studies. Knowledge Justice is available in print and by open access through its publisher, MIT Press. The book includes 17 contributions from 29 Black, Indigenous, people of color practitioners and thought leaders from across the field including folks like Anthony Dunbar, Tonya Sutherland, Todd Hama, and many others. I have the honor of being a part of this collection, and my chapter looks at critical race theory, critical race praxis, and critical archival studies, and considers how we might be able to apply a critical race praxis to archival work. And here again, Dr. Seaford, your work was something I was constantly engaging with as I was thinking through these ideas. These tenets include disruptive and acknowledging systems of power, racism, and privilege, responsive in addressing current archival and social issues, actionable in centering social justice, informed in the inclusion of various knowledge systems and self-reflected practice, and caring in the commitment to minimize harm for people and communities represented in the collections, as well as archival professionals who work on them and with them really. And with this last point, caring, it's rooted in a feminist ethic of care and in the black feminist tradition of care for self and community. It takes real labor to perform all of all of these things, all of these tenets, and requires one to bring the whole self to their work in order to enact them. And as we focus on care by the very nature of our work as cultural stewards and people who perform preservation, we must extend that same level of care to ourselves. I want to conclude by sharing some questions that come up for me when invoking a critical race praxis to my work as an archivist. And I'll say that these are things I consider in multiple aspects and stages of archival labor, from appraisal and acquisition to processing, arrangement, description, even including outreach and instruction. Reflecting on an institution's relationship to and with a collection can reveal systems of power and privilege there have been plenty of instances where in working with the community members, 
and donors, it becomes clear that there are repositories that are better suited for a collection than the one I manage at the University of Texas. In these spaces, it's important to honor those being documented and place the focus on the needs of the collection and the community members most at stake over that of the institution's interests. Additionally, mindful descriptive practices and an ongoing commitment to reparative description can improve access to collections, particularly for those who are most at stake and traditionally marginalized and oppressed. Next, in centering those who are documented as the other, we have the opportunity to promote and facilitate and even train in the practice of counter storytelling, storytelling or of reading against the creator's intent to recognize the humanity of those the record has chosen to objectify. This work is not easy and often requires additional measures of support at all levels. And finally, and this is one of my favorites, what is made possible by creating networks of solidarity and support among archival collections. There is power in the collective and the archive presents us with a space and the opportunity to make connections across time and space in significant ways. So this is, comes up for me all the time as I'm thinking about and working with black individuals and communities from across the Americas, including the Caribbean. So with that, I thank you all, muito obrigada, for your time and attention today. I have my email listed on this slide, along with the web address for the Black Diaspora Archive blog. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Rachel. Super inspiradora sua fala. E é interessante como a gente está longe, mas está pensando em questões tão parecidas, né? o quanto que é importante e fundamental desenhar estratégias para dar visibilidade a esses conjuntos de documentos que ainda estão tão secundarizados e obscurecidos nas instituições. Né? E quanto que a história oral também pode ser uma estratégia que dá força para a vocalização dessas outras histórias e trajetórias. E aí eu achei incrível o projeto de trazer as vozes das, das mulheres ativistas é, que ocuparam a universidade nos anos 60, 70. É, e são estratégias muito parecidas com as quais a gente tem, com as que a gente tem desenvolvido aqui no CPDOC. Sobretudo a ideia de pensar em rede, né? e o quanto que é importante pensar essas questões, discutir essas, essas questões coletivamente, porque são... Nós, 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 nós temos, nós partilhamos de experiências e, e, e também dessas ausências, e é fundamental, é fundamental pensar junto, né? Então, essa ideia de pensar em rede é algo também que me agrada bastante. Então, a gente seguirá conversando com certeza no debate é, eu também estou muito feliz de ter aqui a Marika, assim é. como a Rachel, a gente tem lido a gente tem lido os textos da Marika aqui, se inspirado nos seus debates, então é um prazer imenso tê-la conosco. A Marika Sifor é professora assistente na Information School da Universidade de Washington, trabalha com estudos de gênero, mulheres, sexualidade e a sexualidade, né? Se apresenta como uma pesquisadora feminista e trabalha nas áreas de arquivo e estudos digitais. Suas pesquisas investigam a representação e a marginalização de indivíduos e comunidades por gênero, sexualidade, raça e etnia, com atenção especial para pessoas com HIV, analisando como eles documentam e se representam em arquivos e culturas digitais. É autora do, do livro Viral, Viral Cultures, Activist Archiving in the Age of AIDS. Marika é um prazer tê-la aqui conosco. Thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation and the warm welcome. I'm uh, so honored to be here and so pleased to be in conversation uh, with Rachel, whose work I admire very much as well. Um, and I hope uh, 
that we can uh, use these two presentations um, as a jumping off point for uh, thinking together. Uh, and I do want to note um, as well, I have a one-year-old at home with me as a surprise today. So uh, I might have a slight interruption, but hopefully um, she is occupied with snacks and uh, we are prepared uh, to uh, talk a bit about um, feminist archival practices. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. Um, so I'm going to share a bit about um, the work from my uh, book project uh, that I'll talk more about in just a moment. Uh, this is a page from the archive project zine titled The Eternal Question. It was drawn by Frank Moore, a painter and a founder of the Visual AIDS Archive Project. In it, he asks, has anyone seen my AZT, DAT, DDI, DDC, 3TC, QVC? This is a litany of pharmaceutical acronyms that presents a concise chronology of food of the US Food and Drug Administration's approved pharmaceuticals for treating people with HIV and AIDS. Beginning in 1987 with AZT, each medication, despite new high initial hopes, proved to have a limited efficacy and many side effects. Therapies failed almost universally before 1995, the same year that Frank Moore drew this list. He ends his list with QVC, which is an American home televised shopping channel, um, perhaps the only viable remedy left. In the face of unremittingly grave conditions amidst an ongoing AIDS pandemic, uh, David Hirsch, the co-founder of his archive, uh, told me we had to invent our own hope. I wanna talk uh, a bit about this story here because I want to frame uh, the archives as a kind of cure, a kind of cure in the face of incurability, something that could be larger than just a medical notion of cure. So today I'm gonna to talk just very briefly about the larger book, and then I'm gonna talk about um, the archive project as a kind of remedy and as a kind of practice of care, um, perhaps picking up on some of the kinds of themes that Rachel raised as well. So the book um, project uh, that this comes from is uh, called Viral Cultures, Activist Archiving in the Age of AIDS, and it'll be out in May, uh, so very soon. Um, and it looks at three interrelated uh, collections in New York City uh, documenting AIDS activism from the 1980s and 1990s uh, in the United States. And then it looks as well at how artists and activists are using those records in their work. Uh, and because we're arriving at this conversation from many different locations and with many different kinds of contexts, uh, for the context of AIDS in the US where I work, um, it was, uh, the virus was circulating in the 1960s and 1970s, but it did not become a recognized epidemic until the 1980s. Uh, and in the face of widespread and far-reaching neglect, stigma and discrimination, and as death counts rapidly rose, many activists uh, emerged in response, arguing that confrontational direct action was needed. And I would say that archiving, um, there were, I had the privilege of interviewing many activists uh, who began documenting their work as they were doing it, um, both for kind of immediate purposes uh, for understanding tactics and strategy and activism for documenting uh, violence by police, uh, but also thinking about kind of the long term archival value, thinking about the kind of significance of the work that they were doing. I also want to highlight, of course, uh, that HIV AIDS is an ongoing um, pandemic. And so the story uh, that I tell of documenting this earlier period also has significant implications for the story and our relationship to an ongoing pandemic. So um, 
archives have been kind of under-recognized in this story of AIDS and through the method of archival ethnography, through a series of interviews, as well as analysis of documents and observation uh, at a range of archives and events, uh, I am able to kind of tell a deeper story of the people, the activists, the artists, the curators and archivists, uh, as well as the ideologies, whether political, cultural, biomedical, that created and that shape AIDS archives and their cultural productions. And so I lean heavily, uh, it's my great privilege to be able to share uh, some of their stories and words uh, of the people who created these archives. Uh, and like many community archives, uh, this is a deeply personal effort. And so in the book, I argue that how we engage with AIDS archives dictates more than just the HIV AIDS past. AIDS archives shape possible presence and futures and the distributions of life chances in them. Records hold the power then when harnessed by activists, by artists, by archivists to uh, be mobilized as forces that can re-politicize AIDS and reinvest AIDS with a kind of urgency that's required in addressing the contemporary academic, uh, epidemic, excuse me. And so I want to return here uh, to Frank Moore's zine um, once again. And this zine is a fundamentally uh, important resource in documenting the early story of this project. Um, and in on this page, uh, he again returns to this theme of the kind of inadequacy of any kind of medical treatment, any kind of proposition towards cure in the 1990s. And so from the start, Visual AIDS as a community-based arts organization uh, saw a need for a larger kind of cure uh, that there would need to be a cure that was cultural, that was political as much as a cure that was biomedical. And they used uh, their archive as a resource for cure. Uh, and one of the early executive directors, Nick Debs, wrote right, that what we mean is a cure for cruelty and fear. Please excuse the baby noises in the background there. She's got some things to say as well. Um, and so I wanna frame this as a kind of archival cure, a kind of holistic cure that addresses all of these other kind of aspects of the pandemic, uh, not just the biomedical. And I wanna talk about uh, cure in a particular, in two particular ways um, today. First, as a kind of remedy uh, for deaths, and second, as acts of critical care, and building on some of the conversations I think uh, that Rachel uh, began for us, as I think care is a particularly important kind of keyword in thinking about a feminist, a queer, uh, alternative archiving practice. So the archive project um, was always uh, framed as a kind of remedy for artistic death um, because the activists who founded it, Frank Moore, David Hirsch, and a collective of others uh, saw this kind of uh, destruction of work. People stopped creating work um, because of uh, the need uh, to take care of one another, uh, to care for themselves, uh, to uh, financially survive. Um, and so uh, they saw this kind of destruction of artwork, artistic careers in that respect. And they saw work quite literally being thrown out um, by uh, artists who were dying, by family members who didn't understand the work. Um, and for artists who weren't uh, represented by a gallery, right, uh, there was often kind of no resource or protection for that work. And in the 1990s, uh, having slides of your work taken uh, was quite expensive uh, before digital photography. Uh, and so there was 
they saw this kind of destruction of the record happening and were worried that what they described as two kinds of death were happening, both the death of the physical body, but also the death of an artistic practice and a career. And so the archive project became a kind of proposition towards a remedy, at least for the kind of death that they could address, the death of an artistic practice and career. They began to save um, records by pairing uh, volunteer photographers uh, with artists to document their work. They would then keep a copy of the slides uh, and give one back to the artist. And this kind of creation of photographic documentation is particularly important in this moment when slides are kind of the currency by which work circulates. And so it was one kind of remedy, right? Even then in their first year in 1994, they were able to document the work of 75 artists. And so it quickly grew and kind of circulated through uh, particular networks, especially in New York City, but also beyond it. Though this kind of remedy was never enough. Um, and this is another page from uh, co-founder Frank Moore zine. Uh, You'll see here, it says at the top, the archive, and then we see um, a depiction of uh, its stacks saying dead, dead, dying, sucks, uh, and so forth, right? Uh, they were never able to provide a kind of remedy that would reach all of the kinds of artists that they wanted to. And they were working kind of against the clock in this moment in the heat of emergency. And this doing this kind of archival work was deeply emotional and deeply personal. And as more summed it up, right? It sucks to be in this kind of moment. Uh, and so the kind of cure they could offer, while important, was always limited in scope and scale and thereby impact. Yet it offered an important measure of cure in a time when there was nothing else. And I want to turn to the archive project uh, in relation to cure in one other way today. Uh, I want to talk about it as a practice of critical care. AIDS, as Frank, as David Hirsch told me, introduced me to a world of constant need of constant care, unable despite their best efforts to resolve or to save uh, people from experiences of pain or to stem a parade of death. The archive project was a form of critical care that artists uh, and activists uh, in this space could actually offer to a community of HIV part positive artists that they were a part of. This is an image of David Hirsch with the camera, uh, one of the co-founders of the archive, interviewing artist John Dugdale seated on the couch. Uh, Dugdale was an HIV positive man and an, uh, an honorary member of the committee that worked uh, together to formulate the archive. And his experiences really uh, offered a model of a kind of formulation of care that the archives put forth. Dugdale's vision was deteriorating uh, due uh, to his HIV uh, positive status uh, in relation to uh, the acquisition of CMV. Uh, but with assistance, he was able to continue to make and to show photographs. Through the archives, the activists, artists involved in visual aids work to extend the reach of cure far beyond to artists who uh, might not have had the same kinds of resources and success as Dugdale. They came to come eventually to focus particularly on serving HIV positive women, trans people, people of color, and other artists who had less access to resources and might be excluded from more traditional archives. And it's important to note that they always defined the scope of their collecting very broadly. Uh, they wanted to encompass anyone who identified themselves as HIV positive and anyone who else 
identified themselves as an artist. So rather than using any kind of measure of art world success, they were interested in collecting the records of people who may not have made their living as artists, uh, but still were creating artwork. And those kinds of parameters are very different than other archives working in the AIDS kind of space who are interested in documenting, say, prominent individuals, uh, activists, organizations, uh, rather than these kinds of collections of individuals uh, who might otherwise have no place in an archive and who might not have had great success as an artist in their lifetime. And so this began as a kind of caretaking within a very uh, defined, intimate network, right? Uh, people soliciting friends, lovers, colleagues, acquaintances. But it evolved quickly into something that had a more prodigious kind of orientation. This is a poster made by Roberto Juarez, an artist who was involved in the project in its early years. And it um, plays on the language of a wanted poster uh, to recruit other artists to contribute their work. And in doing so, right, they wanted to uh, showcase the plurality of artistic work and artists living with AIDS, attesting to the wide variety of people impacted and to the myriad experiences of HIV that were encompassed. And so the archive came to include many of the most acclaimed uh, American artists of the 1980s and 1990s, uh, Keith Haring, Felix Gonzalez Torres, David Wanarovich, Robert Maplethorpe, but also included work by artists like Frank Moore himself and John Dugdale, who were well-established but less known beyond the art world, as well as, uh, the kind of folks I talked about a few minutes ago, right? People who may never have achieved other acclaim as artists may have had no other kind of documentation of their artistic work. And so it always had this kind of um, wide scope in its collecting, but just because it's possible for anyone to join doesn't mean that that actually occurred, right? Uh, as executive director Nelson Santos described for me, it would be misleading or oblivious to say that it was a full or completely equal representation. The archive always has had and still has race, gender, class, and geographic shortcomings in its representations of HIV AIDS, its activism and cultural production. These deficits are produced by and reproduce the ways that the archive itself was constituted by a group of gay white men in the United States and in New York specifically. The collection's foundational biases endure in certain ways. Uh, Santos estimated for me in 2016 that of the more than 700 artists who were in, included in the project, only 50 or so were artists of color. Over the last decade, Visual AIDS has made a conscious effort to document, collect, and promote minoritized artists. However, further work is needed to provide culturally competent kinds of care to diversify and extend the archive's reach and representation and thereby its cure. Providing curatorial care could lead to other forms of material and physical care, mobilizing attention to where care is lacking in the contemporary AIDS pandemic. And so uh, I want to turn um, to kind of the on, because much as AIDS is an ongoing epidemic, this is an ongoing archive, right? I'm talking very much about its history and how it arrived in this moment, uh, but this is still an open project, a project that's moving and changing. And so uh, I end um, the chapter that I'm drawing here with an event uh, called Activating the Archive Project that both celebrated the 30 years of uh, collecting uh, in 2018, but also used it as an opportunity uh, to gather, to ask three kinds of core questions from the archives constituency, uh, focusing particularly 
on artists living with HIV and AIDS. Those three questions were first, how can we activate the archive project? Second, how have you activated it in the past? And third, specifically, what does it mean for the archive to be an agent of social change, community building, and empowerment? And everyone in attendance that night received this handout and was asked to respond uh, both verbally, but also do drawings, poems, prose, whatever kind of moved them in this way. Uh, and this archive, right, uh, is really conscientious of its kind of relationship to its community of origin and to the ways that community is evolving as the epidemic too has evolved. Uh, and it invests, right, uh, that community in collectively envisioning what the project's future is uh, and perhaps what new modes of cure and care might be necessary. And so this is a particularly kind of powerful project, I think, uh, because archival cures are complicated, they don't offer a kind of simplistic or surefire resolution, but instead hopefully provide kinds of blueprints towards building different, more just futures. A holistic cure for AIDS requires looking backwards and looking forwards as a means to heal and to move forward without moving on for those missed impacted. One of the artists I had the privilege of interviewing, Eric Rain, uh, told me that within the pain held by the documents of disease, there is life, he argued. He continued, the archives does not aspire to preserve its collections like they're dead, it's history, it's gone. We're preserving them because there is a life and an essence there. If there is no present and future value in the archives, he concluded, we should just bury it and let it rot. And so I wanna call attention to one example of an archive doing uh, kind of community engaged work, doing care work, uh, and to think about what it might mean uh, to, as Michelle Caswell and I have talked about in other work, uh, bring an ethic of care into our work, to bring a kind of feminist perspective, to bring a critical race perspective, to bring a critical perspective uh, to our work as archivists and scholars. Uh, and I look forward uh, to the opportunity to be in conversation with you all today. Muito obrigada, Marika. Super interessante essa perspectiva de pensar o arquivo como remédio para surdez, né? E quando a gente vai escolher esses arquivos, procurando esses novos personagens, a gente não só cria e garante a possibilidade de que novas versões surjam, né, desses documentos, desses, desses conjuntos, mas também a gente está pensando em garantias de direitos, né? Então, super interessante essa, essa discussão pensando a pessoas, a, a pessoas com HIV, na né, experiência de pessoas com HIV, e a gente seguirá conversando certamente. Tem algumas perguntas aqui, já do público, e eu vou colocá-las, a gente faz uma rodada, vocês respondem, depois a gente faz uma nova rodada. Então, aqui tem a primeira pergunta para primeira pergunta a Rachel, do Alexandre. Ele pergunta, gostaria de perguntar a Rachel como são definidos os representantes das comunidades e qual o perfil social desses representantes? Há donas de casa, por exemplo, operários, pessoas jovens que por alguma razão já deixaram arquivos como legados pessoais? A Renata também comenta e pergunta para a Raquel. Boa tarde, que apresentação linda. Nas entrevistas, existe a preocupação em perguntar como os participantes pensam o trabalho de documentação, incluindo o depoimento oral e os outros documentos? Eles falam do processo? É uma pergunta da Renata, Rachel. E agora uma pergunta para as duas, e a gente fecha esse bloco. Rachel e Marika, muito obrigada pelas pesquisas, falas e presença de vocês. Elas nos estimulam a permanecer fortes. Sobre o que foi anunciado hoje, trago para Marika a reflexão que a Hobbes lançou ontem 
A Catherine Hobbs fez uma mesa ontem, Marika, participou conosco de uma mesa ontem. Então, para a Marika, faço a reflexão que a Hobbes lançou ontem. Os arquivos pessoais são a documentação de uma vida ou a documentação da documentação? Quando você expôs, por meio da arte, a representação do sentimento de quem vive uma doença dita sem cura, uma época, e transforma isso justamente em arte, fico com a impressão que ficamos na segunda hipótese. Como você analisa essa consideração? Agradeço a atenção e torço por mais presença de crianças e mães nos eventos acadêmicos. Um abraço. Ok, I can begin. Thank you for these really thoughtful questions. For me, when I am in the community in Austin and speaking with members of the community, whether as an archivist doing my job or just as someone who lives here in Austin, I'm always surprised when I'm speaking with um, Black folks and people of color, when I talk about the archive and thinking about their papers, the surprise that I am met with. People think, why, why would I give my papers to an archive? I don't have anything of value. I don't, why would that be important? And I love that conversation because I'm able to help them see, to recognize that archives, whether in an institution like the university or in the library or a community archive exist to help them preserve their legacies. That the items in the garage, in the basement, in the closet are of value. Um, that they tell a story of their family, of their family, their own even um, impact in the world and in our small community of Austin, Texas. And so I am always trying to raise the profile of the archive so that these different demographics um, hopefully can see themselves um, as partners and as, as people who can and should be in relationship with an archive, right? Um, so in terms of the collections that are in the Black diaspora so far, many of them come through personal connections that faculty at the university have um, that I've been able to make of people who come to the archive and just through their visit, then start thinking about the people they know. So it really has become a community effort, which I love, right? That, that this collection building is happening. Um, it's not just isolated. It's not just me making decisions. It really is a collective effort. And I think that that is, is very important. Uh, and then to think about the oral history interviews. Um, the women interviewed, the idea of an oral history, I got it from them. I was meeting with the women who donated, telling them a little bit about the progress that had been made with the internship. And one of them just said very casually in conversation, well, we should do an oral history collection. That would be great. And I never forgot it. Uh, and so they, many of them were, again, that same kind of, even though like, the idea of this collection wasn't new. It had come up before in conversation when we became serious about it and put together the plan and approached women to be interviewed. Many of them felt, well, what, what do I have to say? What, why are you asking me? I don't, I don't have anything worthy of an oral history collection for the archive. And I think this kind of gets back a little bit to what you were just talking about, Dr. Seifers, the archive as a place. Um, of, of remedy almost, like a place of care. And so if you're not thinking about the archive in that way, um, it, it can seem very distant. And by engaging with the archive, with collections, with the ar archival workers who explain um, and do the work of really trying to bring people in, when you see that shift, when people really do begin to see the archive as a place where things can be loved on and cared for and made accessible, the tone shifts and there's a, it's, it's, that is significant. Um, 
That's really important. So I, I got to experience that with many of the women who were interviewed, um, even though my my intern, who I'm still in, she graduated. I'm still in touch with her. She she's fantastic. So um, with that, I'll 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 stop. Thank you for those uh, questions and for your comments um, as well, Rachel. I think uh, that um, uh, the way you just talked about the project, right, really kind of following uh, the lead of uh, the people who uh, whose stories um, you've uh, had the privilege of documenting, right, um, following the kinds of formats uh, really speaks, I think, to, to the way visual aids, right, has used slides and other, they had hoped, I think, at the start to be able to uh, collect artworks, but that, of course, is uh, unfeasible for a kind of small community organization. And so collecting in a format uh, that I think uh, was core to how artwork was circulated. Uh, and now they, of course, take digital files um, and images as well. Uh, makes a great deal of sense. And I think right, part of our job uh, as scholars or as archivists, right, is to follow uh, the stories and the lead of the people who were privileged enough to work with. Um, and I think the kind of point uh, you raised, um, that was raised in the question and it was raised in uh, Rachel's comments as well, right, I think, that there, it's worth us kind of thinking about and teasing out multiple kinds of uh, relationships, right? And seeing archival work as uh, relational work. Um, and I think the piece I mentioned that uh, Michelle Caswell and I wrote uh, is an article on applying a feminist ethics of care uh, from 2016 in Archivaria and that work, I think, has been taken up and expanded in ways that are vital. But we began by talking about four uh, kinds of relationships, right? The relationship between the archivist and the records creator, the relationship between the archivist and the subject of the records, the relationship between the archivist and the larger community, uh, and then uh, other very smart uh, colleagues have expanded that to thinking about relationships with donors, to thinking about the relationships we have with other archivists, uh, with students we work with, um, and all of the people whose kind of work and labor and perspective is so vital to doing our work. And so I think that part of what a kind of feminist perspective can bring here, right, is a thinking about those kinds of relationships and the ways in which archives are reflections of these kinds of relationships and what our responsibilities are uh, to the people whose records uh, we hold um, and the people whose lives are implicated in those records. Muito obrigada, Marika e Rachel. A gente tem mais algumas perguntas. É, eu gostaria de perguntar, é o Alexandre que pergunta, gostaria de perguntar a Marika como distinguir o que pode ser arte contemporânea e documento arquivístico da AIDS. Por favor, me diga como circulam as obras de arte que pertencem ao arquivo. Acho que eu consegui entender, Alexandre, acho que está tudo certo. A Pamela pergunta, boa tarde, parabéns pelas apresentações. Gostaria que as, que as participantes comentassem sobre os limites das práticas relacionadas ao post-custodialism, custodialism, não sei se é assim que pronuncia, e com, as, e, 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 com a, e com quais tensões se deparam nas experiências relatadas. Eu queria incluir uma pergunta minha para essa rodada. É... Quando eu li as biografias de vocês, eu fiquei muito curiosa que tanto Marika quanto Rachel, Marika se autodenomina, se intitula é, uma arquivista feminista. E a Rachel se intitula uma arquivista da diáspora negra. Aqui no Brasil, é, é, evidentemente que é, quando vocês se, se autodenominam, vocês dizem, deixam evidentes as suas leituras, análises e também as suas posturas institucionais. 
Aqui no Brasil isso é muito pouco comum na área da área do, entre os documentalistas e arquivistas. Ainda vigora uma ideia que é possível é, que o trabalho do arquivista e do documentalista tenha a ver com neutralidade e objetividade. Eu queria que vocês comentassem um pouco essas questões para que a gente pudesse provocar também, eu acho que vai ser importante para discutir é, questões é, como essa para o público que nos assiste. E eu acho que eu deveria ser essa perspectiva, eu imagino, sobre a neutralidade e a objetividade e a desirabilidade dessas como qualidades de prática profissional, Uh, is something uh, that we also have in a U.S. context. I think um, there's been a great deal of scholarship and critical practice uh, and work that does both those things over the last, uh, well, I guess, kind of 25 uh, or so years that has really kind of fundamentally challenged uh, the notions that Uh, objectivity and neutrality are possible or desirable. Uh, and I think I'm very privileged to be able to build uh, kind of on that work and thinking, but those ideas are still um, present in uh, kind of the training and uh, work of archives in the US as well. Um, and so, But I take all of my scholarship, um, whether it's kind of work that deals with explicit kind of notions from feminist theory, whether on affect or on an ethics of care, um, but even the work that isn't explicitly kind of in uh, dealing with a particular kind of feminist theory and bringing it into an archival context, I see all of my work as uh, invested in a feminist project. And for me, that's a way of uh, calling attention to issues of power. Um, and for me, what is powerful about kind of a feminist perspective on our work is that it allows us to uh, examine kind of structures of power that already exist But also part of what happens, I think, in those kind of structural arrangements of power is they often make it very hard to imagine our way out of them. And so I see uh, feminist work and feminist theory as also giving us the kinds of tools uh, to think our way out of um, the kind of current arrangements and structures of power and oppression and a ways to begin to kind of envision a way out uh, of systems that often can seem so big and so powerful that there's uh, the kinds of possibilities for envisioning even a different uh, kind of present or future are very limited and foreclosed. And I'll let Rachel jump in on neutrality and objectivity and I can always circle back to the other part of the question. Sure. So I focus primarily on records and documents that um, explore or document in some capacity the lives of, of Black folks. And so with that, anti-Black and confronting anti-Blackness is a regular part of my job, um, especially in the historical context. I do a lot of research and work on the domestic slave trade in Texas. Um, and due to Texas's geography, a lot of that includes records from the Caribbean. There was a flow from the Caribbean into Texas. And so by the very nature of the, the provenance of these records, right? And taking a step further, the, the archive, the formal kind of academic archive as a colonial project, right? So I'm in this space, with these roots, now looking at these records um, that dehumanize, that obstruct, that, that in very roundabout ways allow us, allow me to try to excavate um, Black life, right? So the very nature of the work that I'm doing is not neutral. It's very politicized in a historical sense. Uh, so I, It's so funny to me when people still think that archives are neutral because I, I just don't, 
I, I can't accept that. <laughs> I understand where it comes from and um, what a privilege it must be to, to be in a space where that is true for you. But for me, it is so far from the reality. When you begin the work of, of focusing on folks who are at the, who have historically been on the margins, been oppressed, um, who are facing persecution um, and, and things of that nature, it, that's part, I think, Marika, getting to what you were talking about, kind of using a feminist lens or praxis to help us imagine a way out of this is so critical, right? Because not, archives for me very much are um, a tool for social justice. And if the folks at the margins, both documented in the record and in the present moment living in the mar being pushed to the margins, like none of us can get free until all of us are free. And we're using records and archives as a tool to achieve that. Uh, and so for me, just the approach that I bring inherently has a lot of, or actually no neutrality <laughs> um, in, in, in that way. So while my focus professionally so far has been, I guess, um, on the, the Black diaspora, on Black communities, I don't see that as limiting because for so long, these kinds of records and this kind of work was silenced and it didn't exist. There is so much to do. Um, and so instead of limits, I just see so much possibility and so much work to do, hey, baby. <laughs> Muito obrigada. She said hi. <laughs> só para dizer, só para dizer, Marika, que aqui bebês são muito bem-vindos. Então, <laughs> fica à vontade. <laughs> para a gente concluir essa conversa super agradável, eu queria fazer uma pergunta para as duas. Tem a ver com um pouco daquilo que vocês já disseram até aqui. De maneira geral, as instituições guardam registros de, do poder, né? registros coloniais, registros médicos, é, mas muitas vezes são esses os registros que a gente tem sobre indivíduos ou grupos. Como, qual é o caminho, ou como vocês têm trabalhado para encontrar nesses registros é, evidências de, e rastros de experiências e subjetividades de pessoas e grupos? É, encontra, entendendo que é possível, é, é possível também é uma pergunta, é encontrar nesses arquivos é, as experiências e trajetórias de pessoas subalternizadas, como é que na prática vocês têm feito esse exercício? I can begin with that one. Um, so one example, yeah, that's a great, a great question, thank you. One example, this is something that happens pretty regularly for me, particularly with uh, records related to slavery, is in those records and in the work that I'm doing to identify Black people is to change the language. So I might encounter a document that is um, John Smith, plantation account book. And then when I'm inside and seeing the names of people, making that the focus, using naming enslaved people, um, refocusing, the record has been documented and described for so long in a certain way. And that doesn't mean that that has to be my interpretation. And it most often isn't. So using this, the archive as a space to reframe records and the information that we're able to glean from them. And often the records creation or intent isn't the, the way I'm using them, the, the information I'm able to glean from them doesn't always align with the intent, but the intent also did not include recognizing the humanity of black people, right? So because this, I have record, it's the, the body of records is so limited. 
um, due to the, the nature of slavery and the oppression uh, of Black people on a global scale, we have to do that recovery work. And in that there's an opportunity to reframe how different kinds of documents are used and the language that we invoke to describe them. And with students being at a university, I'm able to work with students um, on that as well and get their input in thinking about how we really read against the grain. And there are scholars who have done tremendous work in this area, Jessica Marie Johnson, Marissa Fuentes, just to name a, a few. So it's, this work is hard. And so it's, it's heartening. It's heartening to know that there are others who are, are always thinking about these things as well. Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, since I'm not kind of a practicing archivist anymore, I really see uh, teaching, uh, I think, in ways that resonate with what Rachel was just saying as a real kind of important space um, for doing this kind of work, for uh, changing our profession, right? Um, and I think... Uh, with my, I work with undergraduate students, but also with students who are doing their masters in library and information science. Uh, and when I work with our uh, master students, uh, I really see it as my job to both kind of introduce them to uh, kind of how we arrived uh, at professional practice and what it looks like and what the kind of values of our profession have been, but also to see it as a means of uh, kind of opening up conversations that are kind of emerging or in progress um, as well uh, in thinking about how we kind of remake, use archives as a tool to remake uh, structures of oppression uh, and matrices of power and how we kind of navigate those roles as professionals is a big kind of part of my focus. And I am very fortunate to be able to draw on some of the work of scholars that Rachel already mentioned, um, but also uh, people like Grayson Brillmeyer who are writing about disability uh, and uh, folks like Tanya Sutherland who work on um, again, archives of uh, the African diaspora, uh, as well as colleagues who work uh, in indigenous archival studies uh, and draw on indigenous thinkers in their work. Uh, I'm always very fortunate to be able to kind of introduce students to that work and to thinking critically about kind of what practice looks like and how they might kind of become advocates as well uh, for kind of transforming our profession, at least very slowly. I think uh, it often feels like we're tipping away at tiny pieces of this kind of work, but um, if many of us are tipping away at tiny pieces, hopefully uh, it leads to a kind of greater transformation. I agree that at the chipping away, um, it, it is hard, right? Doing this work can be really challenging. And so the community of those of us in this space uh, is so tremendous to the spirit, <laughs> to the morale. Um, it makes such a difference to know that, you know, we have comrades who maybe not, we're not all in the same location, but being spread out, there's strength in numbers, uh, even globally. And so even, to be invited into this space today, I think speaks to that as well. These networks of solidarity, solidarity and how um, we're able to exchange with one another in order to push our individual communities further and ultimately make some larger impact. Muito bom, muito bom. A gente sai aqui com vontade de criar novos projetos coletivo, de pensar cada vez mais de maneira combinada nas nossas práticas, experiências. Então, fica aqui um convite para novos encontros, para que a gente possa se acompanhar. Agradeço imensamente a presença da Marika, da Rachel, 
É, agradeço a todas as pessoas que estão nos acompanhando até aqui. Também quero agradecer especialmente a equipe da, da FGV que está trabalhando aqui por trás das câmeras para manter, para fazer com que esse evento seja possível, em especial as tradutoras que é, garantiram que essa mesa fosse possível, a gente conversando em português e inglês, a Rita e a Beth. É, essa mesa em breve estará disponível no canal da FGV. É, queria mais uma vez agradecer ao ICA, que está financiando esse evento, ao Conselho Internacional de Arquivos. E para finalizar, gostaria de informar a todas e todos que amanhã, na parte da manhã, teremos a mesa redonda Ações Educativas em Acervos, que terá a participação de Atila Tolentino, do Ministério da Economia, e Ivana Parrela, da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. A mesa contará com a mediação de Daniele Chaves Amado, do CPDOC. Até amanhã. Um abraço a todos e todas. Obrigada.